Basically, things that I have seen people do, uh, and I've seen people commonly do um, that other people who work in the operating room don't like. So they're not just random things that I made up in my head. They're, they're tips and pointers for stuff that I've seen people do. So things you should do is uh, introduce yourself to everyone. There's lots of people in the operating room. Teams are not always consistent. It's not always the same. So they may have absolutely no idea who you are. Um, the first, when I was a student, we had different colour hats depending on your designation. Um, my student colour was apricot. It was such a love. It was very good for my complexion. I was never so happy as when I got the dark blue doctor's hat that I could wear in the eye. Now we don't have that now. Uh, I actually think that's a really good idea, um, so that everyone knows who everyone is. But they don't know if you're a nursing grad, they don't know if you're there as the company representative who makes the titanium screws, they don't know if you're a tech, they have no idea who you are. So firstly, part of the time out, you should be able to, uh, allowed to introduce yourself, but otherwise let the nurses know who you are, particularly the nurses, they're the ones that that's sort of their home, the surgeons swan in and out, they probably know who you are. So do introduce yourself. We love it when people are interested, but do it at the right time. If everything seems a little tense, it probably is a little tense. Probably not the right time to ask the question. Um, or if there's yelling or screaming or, gee, sir, what are you yelling about? It's probably not the right time to ask questions. Mm -hmm. But people do like you to ask questions and to be involved and to be interested. Do look interested. You're given the opportunity to do so. Um, so if you get a chance to scrub in, um, you know, if someone will take you through a catheter or whatever, do help where you can, even if it's just holding the head or whatever, help where possible, help move the patient, look like you're trying to be part of the team. Um, if things are starting to look a bit tense or whatever, do stay out of the way. Don't be sort of in the way when someone's trying to move a trolley in or whatever. Do try and stay out of the way. Part of that, you've got to be confidential and private about these patients at all times. Um, a lot of the patients who are in there are unconscious, so they're particularly not maintaining their own privacy. Um, you can think that something's really interesting, and I'll give you some examples of not maintaining privacy, um, but, uh, you know, for instance, um, I very clearly remember one of my registrars being incredibly excited about the first meningioma that she removed and putting, uh, that she'd just done a first meningioma on Facebook, and of course, one one of her friends was a friend of the person whose mother had had a meningioma removed that day at that hospital. She didn't mention any names or anything, but a long chain of events. And it was like, so someone was practicing on my mother who had never done this before. So, you know, you never quite know who is who is who. Not ignore the nurses or the technicians and only talk to the doctors or the surgeons. That, that is actually their workplace. We swan in and swan out and go and do other things, but they're the people who work there every day. Ask questions when things are tense, I've told you that. Don't get in the way. 
Uh, so have a bit of situational awareness. Sometimes you can be so excited about what's going on that you don't really have sort of awareness of what's going on around you. Try and be aware of what people are trying to do, people moving things around, whatever. Try and not unsterilise things. It actually takes quite a while to do things in a way that doesn't unsterilise things in theatre. Like I would never be in theatre and step backwards without going, what is behind me? But it takes quite a while to learn how to do that or even to not scratch your shoulder when you scrub or whatever. It, it actually takes quite a long while to just think about that stuff. Don't unsterilise things. But if you do, please fess up. Please say, oh, my God, I think I might have just touched that trolley right there because that keeps the patient safe. So if you have done something and you think, oh, we, we will actually, re someone might go, mm -hmm, but we will respect you and trust you if you tell us that you have, you think you may have unsterilised something. We would much rather hear. If it's boring and you don't want to be there, leave. Okay, medical school's not now where you actually have to be sitting there for 15 hours watching the back of someone working down a hole that you can't see. If it's boring, Excuse yourself, fly if you want it. I have a lecture. I'm just sitting in the corner looking completely bored. This is not a use, that's not a useful teaching experience for you. We don't want you to sit there looking bored. How many times do I send people out again? The other day I said to my resident, Are you bored? And she was like, and She said, uh, Yeah, kind of. And I said, You can leave if you want to, you're just standing there. Uh, so don't, don't just hang around. Think. Chat amongst yourselves, talk, play with your phone, text, update Facebook, or take photos. A lot of people get a bit over enthusiastic and they think, oh, wow, this is so cool, and suddenly so start taking photos. We can't take photos without getting the patient's permission in advance to take what we call clinical photos. Okay, you can't just rock in and take a photo of a patient on your phone because it's interesting. Um, there might be some specific examples where the surgeon will invite you to take a photo that's completely not identifying or whatever, but do not take photos. Um, that's a common thing that I see that people think, oh, this is so interesting. You can take photos of bits of equipment or whatever, but anything that has a person in it, including a member of staff, then you, you should get their permission first. Uh, and then be really careful about what you do with that, with that stuff. Uh, where you put it, who you tell. Um, it's a confidential environment. It's a highly sensitive confidential environment. There's a lot of naked people lying around on tables unconscious and so everyone is it's even more heightened than say in a ward or anything else. Questions about basic theatre etiquette. It's pretty clear. Yes. Anyone stuffed up yet? Anyone had a nurse be mean to them? Oh. Yes. Yes. See so look I knew, I knew. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a constant tension. Um, you'll find them being lovely, lovely than grads, but then you're kind of in the way. It is how it is. Um, you know, we're in, the, we're in the way. Really, the surgeons are in the way. The operating room would run perfectly well if the surgeons just weren't there and we didn't have to do any <laughs> operations. And, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so basic surgical instruments. Who gets completely confused by the names of all the instruments, what they are, what they do, and why you might use them? That will continue to about third or fourth year residency. We don't worry about that at the moment. You still won't know the names of most things. But um, basic instruments, uh, they, there's sort of four basic types of instruments. Tracked or exposed, thing we'll be saying here in surgery, but everything in surgery. Yeah, they're filming me here. This is a problem. I probably should say this, but uh, everything in surgery is exactly the same as sex. It's about position and access. Okay, <laughs> so you've got to have the patient in the correct position and access to the structure on which you want to work. Uh, so retracting and exposing instruments are about access, about being able to see what you're doing. Cutting and dissecting instruments, obviously cutting stuff out or cutting stuff open is a major part of doing an operation, and so um, they're important instruments. Including instruments, um, a lot of tissues need to be held and there's a lot of tubes with holes in them with nasty stuff coming out of it, like blood or poo or 
something something else. So there's a lot of things to occlude um, a hollow uh, organ. Being a whole instrument because exactly for access, you've got to get stuff out of the way to see other stuff. So they're the four basic categories. They're pretty simple. Um, it's, it's just basic mechanics. I'm just going to go through a few of those. Acting and exposing instruments. So they hold back, or hot, retract is just a word for hold back, but we like to make everything sound as, as complicated as possible because it doesn't sound very professional if we say, if we say give me the curved hold or backer. Uh, so we call them retractors. Um, to retract organs or tissue to gain access or exposure, and they can be either self-retaining, that's why this only works if, I'm, if you're all down now. Uh, self-retaining or So self-retaining is something like this, where you can get a wound open, and it has some sort of a ratchet or a locking mechanism that means that it will stay open under the tension that you put it under. Self-retaining. Huh? Don't yeah, it's terrible. Don't worry. There's still plenty of really boring stuff that you can hold on to. Although the one thing that was the medical student's job was open door letters. And it was it was usually done with your own hand and you had to put you sort of stand sideways and put your hand in and hold the liver out of the way and a bit of small bowel the other way by poking your finger out and you had to do that for hours. It was awful. Thank the Lord for that question. Um, so that's, um, that is, uh, or there's something that's handheld, uh, which basically means that there's something that holds onto the bit of tissue and you have to pull on it. That's the thing that really makes you know when you've got carpal tunnel syndrome um, <laughs> because you may be pulling like this for however long um, while the surgeon does whatever they do. Uh, and, and, and they come in a myriad of uh, different shapes and sizes, basically depending on the tissue you're dealing with and the force that you want to exert. Sort of at the top there, you know, a, a cat's paw, often the skin, something small, you, don't, you just want to grab it and pull it out of the way, even with the little sharp hooks, or if you've got a bit of a shot to get the edge under, then to pull it out of the way that way. Bigger on that side, these are various skin hooks which the plastic surgeons use, so just to hook through the skin and pull it out of the way while you're doing something fairly superficial and then, you know, the self retainer. Um, there's some big things, so most things have eponymous names, which is a tautology, really, isn't it? Named after a name, so most things are named after the surgeon who designed them. Um, years ago, including this hospital, when I first got here in 1997, we would have an instrument maker. Uh, and they would often make a lot of our instruments for us rather than buying them from the company. And surgeons would be constantly going, can you make the hooky thing a little hookier or do this or that? But a lot of these instruments were designed somewhere where the surgeon designed them. So a diva retractor is a you know, big, long curve to get like a liver out of the way or get a bunch of bowel out of the way. It's, it's gentle, it's got no pokey bits, but it's good for pulling tissues and organs out of the way. Deep abdominal chest incisions, and you can get wide ones, narrow ones, depending on you know whether you want to put a dent in the liver or not. <laughs> which comes in various sizes, basically just has two ends that you can kind of hook under something, particularly skin, but you can also get it under a bit of, uh, a bit of um, bowel, um, but again, for, you you can use it deep inside for deep abdominal or chest incisions. Or that I showed you, and in America that's a Zen retractor, but not here, it's a cat's paw. <coughs> for superficial incisions, and those little blades are quite sharp, uh, and so they can um, really grab onto thick tissues and pull them out of the way. Uh, and the, the rake that is I'm passing around is really just a, a large version of the cat's paw. Um, and then there's some that you can kind of, kind of do, make your own tractor. Um, so this is a malleable. Uh, and basically we use this a lot in the brain because you can kind of make it what, whatever amount of holding back you like. So if I've got a little bit of brain where the lip is just sitting up here, um, I might want to just put 
a very gentle little bit of retraction on it. Certainly, I don't want to put that rake retractor with the chlorine bits in it. That's not allowed. That's against the rules. Um, or if I've got a very deep incision, like a, a long track in the brain, I might put two of these in like that, which really um, I can put down and it, it's just got this little curve at the bottom and just hold things out of my way without actually putting a lot of retraction on it. And these come from about five mils uh, all the way up to sort of two inch sort of size. What's two inches in which I don't know. A bit more than double this. Um, yeah, so um, something that uh, um, other people use malleables as well. Big malleable will work quite well on liver or something else. Um, this is the one that you're, um, you're holding around, it comes in various sizes, the self retainer. Um, it's usually for shallow incisions, particularly skin incisions, although there are various versions of it that have longer bits that go in. So if you've got, as is increasingly the case, a big fat patient, um, you've got longer hooks in to try and get, uh, get the fat back as well as the skin. Um, all sorts of different ends, like a, a guilty, which just has the two um, spikes rather than a whole length of spikes. Uh, and then the mother of all self-retaining retractors, which we actually don't use that often anymore. So a very common thing for things like a soft or some of the operations that now are much better done by by laparoscopy through what's called the Mercedes Benz incision. Um, down like this and straight down here. So a laparoscopy, a clamshell of, of the chest to get to say the gastroesophageal junction. Uh, and so the two blades there would go um, into the abdominal incision and the, the big one in the middle could pull up this way or it could be turned around the other way if you're trying to get into the pelvis and pull down that way. Obviously, and, and it's got cranks and various things that mean you can just crank that up to wherever you want. Um, the cracking of the ribs as you as you opened it—it it was a, a pretty brutal kind of thing. I mean, it was an awful thing. But anyway, we don't. It, it would be pretty rare to use that anymore. If you did a big trauma where you had to just do a slash and burn of the abdomen to try and work out, you know, smash kidney, smash liver. Damage control surgery. I guess that would be when you would um, still uh, still call call out the valve for a tractor. But I haven't seen it used for years. But then again, I haven't seen much valve in the years either. Yeah. About retractors. No, no, I don't think. I'll just check. I don't have any more retractors in the so then the next thing is the cutting and dissecting instruments. Well, they're pretty easy. They're knives or scissors. Um, and the knives and scissors are basically just designed for what are you cutting and how deep is and how easy is it to see. Um, so the knives, um, everyone has their favourite. What's written up there is not a hard and fast, like where it says cut skin, cut this, cut whatever. But big knives blades for skin because skin is tough. Big smaller knives with smaller blades the deeper you get uh, because the tissue tends to be more fragile and because you're not going to be making such big swipes. Um, so that, that's the basic rule and there's all sorts of nice little knife handles. You know I would start with the number four for the scalp incision uh, and by the time I got to Dura I'd be using the, you know, the number 15 blade. And you know, the number 11, obviously, if you're trying to make small mix in something, then that's very useful. So everyone gets to have their like, favourite blade for particular activities. Um, a lot of people use a number 11 blade for a retinoidition. So if you're opening a sylvian fissure or something, you, you can just on the arachnoid and it'll just kind of fall apart. As long as you just don't rub it on the part as well. But you know, <laughs> that's, that's what you learn to do in brain surgery school. The best instrument for division of tissues, they're less traumatic than, uh, than scissors. You know, scissors are going to have a crushing zone as well. So 
if you really want to do something clean the minimal chunk, so a lot of stuff in brain, that's why we use it for arachnoid dissection because there's no crushing zone. Um, and so a well-wielded scalpel is the most uh, delicate way to divide tissue. Um, but it has to be wielded well. So certainly I've seen tentative medical students and I've said, okay, you can make the cut. Put the scalpel down and kind of make the cut and remove three cells depth um, <laughs> from being a little bit scared. That's okay, it's all right. Um, then you, you say, okay, a bit deeper. When you put the scalpel blade back in again, you never put it quite right at the bottom of the cut you made before. So then you go just a little bit to the side and you make another three cells. And so what you actually end up with is quite a jagged cut. What do you think the disadvantage, I mean, you can't see that with your eyes, but what do you think the disadvantages are of that? Doesn't matter, who cares? We're dealing with something and closing up. Maybe, but if this is, we're talking sort of a micro difference. Germs. Little pockets of, you know, stuff can get stuck in there. So, you know, if your wound is microscopically jagged, it just gives little pockets of blood to collect, and where there's blood collecting, then there's there's bugs collecting, and all the bugs come from the skin. So you've taken a knife that you've rubbed across the germy skin, and then you picked it up, and with all the lovely germs on it, you put it a little bit deeper, and you've rubbed it into a different fold, and then you put it a little bit deeper. So you've got to learn how to make a really nice cut with a scalpel that's appropriate depth and strength for the tissue that you're looking for. And then there are things that sort of are the skill of surgery, and when you see a really good surgeon operate, um, and you just see how there, there is this economy of movement, okay? You cut the skin, the skin is cut to the perfect depth. There's no kind of mucking around or, uh, you know, I'll fix this bit up here or whatever. Um, that, that's when you see someone who really knows how to wield the instrument the appropriate thing. Um, it's a beautiful thing to watch a good surgeon operate, if you like surgery. It's a beautiful thing. I could do it now. Um, it should be held in a way that permits control but freedom of movement and that depends on sort of what you're trying to do. It, it may be a very fine sort of pencil movement uh, or it may be, you know, with a finger down to cut tough tissues. So you have to learn how you're going to use your scalpel and of course it's a blade and a blade handle. So you've got some versatility as to the heaviness and the length of the blade, blade handle and the heaviness and the shape of the blade. Just some blade handles. Who's put a scalpel blade on a blade handle? Watch the nurses do it with their fingers. Take every time they see someone do it. I, I can't do it. I, even though I know that if you turn it the other way, you can't possibly cut yourself or whatever, I cannot handle a scalpel. The nurses do it with an instrument. You can do it with an instrument. Do it with an instrument. More versions for use on the wards or whatever. Um, so scissors are for division of tissues, sutures and dressings. Um, tissue scissors are usually lighter with the finest possible cutting edge um, and smoother points so that you don't poke something beyond the end of the scissors with a sharp point. Straight scissors for close to the surface and curved scissors for deep. I'm not sure what scissors I've got here. Yeah. That is scissors. Micro scissors. Alright, so bayoneted. What's the purpose of a bayonet? Why would you bother bayoneting an instrument? Why is this just not straight? Do you vision? That's right. So my hand of my line of sight to the tips. Okay, these have these are just have no ratchet mechanism or anything because these are the cutting obviously very fine tissue and they've got a very slight curve uh, so that the tip sits up exactly where I can see it. Um, so I mean they're the ultimate in scissors, micro scissors. Um, the rest of the scissors that we use, are, um, the rest of the scissors that we use. Um, are, are basically sort of pretty common sense. 
be asked to cut stuff. That's usually the first thing that a medical student gets asked to do, cut these stitches, or if someone really likes you for the day, they might let you, you know, cut up an artery that's been tied off or something like that. So, this thing with scissors is, this is not occupational therapy cut and paste, okay? It, it does actually matter if you um, cut a bit that's not supposed to be cut. So the first rule with scissors is never close them unless you can see the tips and you know exactly where the tips are. Particularly, you know, I've seen people cut sutures and then cut the actual, the thing beyond, uh, you know, make a cut in the skin or cut the suture that's just been done and make it fall open. That's always a good thing to go. That makes the surgeon love you. So all of, the, all of those things. Or you cut the suture and you, you've got the scissors down and you just happen to get cut the knot off so that it falls apart. And, you know, that's so know where the end of the, ends of the sutures are, where the end of the scissors are. Make sure you're in a good position and you've got good control of the blade, that the blade is comfortable in your hand. And so make that, that's, that's the main thing. Now, I don't have some scissors here to show you, so I'm going to use something else that is a similar thing. So these are scissors, these are, um, these are um, legal clip applicators. But the way to hold scissors is your thumb in one, finger, so probably all of the cutting that you've done in occupational cutting and pasting in kindergarten, you use your thumb and index finger. Thumb and fourth finger, so that your index finger can control, okay? So that's that's the right way to use it. You give yourself a little bit of extra sort of cutting force <coughs> with your third and your fifth finger. But that's the, and that's pretty much the way, if you have to hold the instrument, to practice you won't need to hold the instrument with your fingers through the holes but if you still need to put your fingers through the holes that's the thing to do the next step as you get a little bit better is that you will pour finger through that hole but it's still the same basic thing a good reason for doing that is you have much more freedom in terms of around uh, and then eventually uh, you can get to the stage where you don't have to put your fingers in the holes at all and i'll show you that in a um, and you get best control if you're if it's in the tips of your fingers, not if you've got the instrument sort of jammed into your palm like that. That you freedom of movement is actually in supination and pronation. Whereas if you've got um, your instrument a bit more there, you've got more wriggle room with your fingers as well as your arm. So the, the less you're sort of hanging on to it to your life, the better it will go. Um, okay, so cutting instruments. So straight nail scissors, big fat scissors, good for stitches. You can, you can use that for cutting occupational therapy as well. Um, they're basically, they're not very fancy scissors. Curved mayos, so if you're getting a little bit deeper, particularly in the abdomen or the chest, the, the tips Curve up. It's the same as bayonetting. Uh, it just gives you a little bit of a, if the tips curve up, we've got a little bit of a better line of sight as to where the ends are. Um, Mets and bound. So, why? So, if you look at the curved mayos there, look at those. And why? What, what, what's the difference with those? To, compared to the Metses. If you were looking at those two instruments, what would you say those difference to be? They're longer, so you, you can put them down a deeper hole. Yep. What else? The curved whereas the nails. Yeah, so they're usually curved, so a deeper hole, curve the blade so that you can see the tips. Yep. Blades aren't as heavy, and there's for these because they're the deep. There's a long ratio between the length of the blade and the length of the handle at the top. So you can only open them a certain amount. Um, you know, it's not a great big wide thing that you can get a whole bunch of stuff in. So this is for being down a deep hole and just trying to snip, snip, snip away at something. 
all right, but with reasonable control. You've got a long lever to put your index finger on to make sure that you've got stability. Stuff like this, they're just scissors. Like, they're, you could use kitchen scissors, you just can't sterilise them, so it doesn't really matter. That's scissors. Nope. Right, clamping and occluding instruments. Basically, blood vessels or hollow organs to present to stop poo or blood or something else from getting out. Um, they've usually got a locking mechanism. So, if I had a memory so that they can be locked on. I think someone's been rifling through my uh, my instruments collection. Okay. The other thing that they can clamp is a needle. So this is a clamping instrument to hold the needle. Uh, and the locking mechanism is a ratchet uh, such that you can put a desired amount of force for the clamp depending on how much force you want to put on. Um, and obviously that also depends on configuration of the blades, the width of the blades, the amount of force that the blades will put on. Um, these are the ones that you really learn how to not put your fingers in. If you want to be a surgeon, steal an old archery faucet from the theatre and go home and do this a thousand times. A really good surgeon, one of those ones that you can watch for hours per day, which I can't do, so you don't want to watch me for hours per day. Learn to do it with your non dominant hand as well, as smoothly as you can do it with your dominant hand. And most of the real surgical nerds I know learn how to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's got a ratchet. When you start a count, same thing as you do with scissors. So you can use your forefinger, just use your thumb. And then practice until you can put no fingers in. Hemostat um, is something for arteries. They can be curved if you're getting down a hole with a curve, they can be straight. The blades have got uh, a little bit of sort of crenellation on them. Um, and the ones you use really depends on whether you want that vessel to open up again, re anastomose or, or not. So you can have certain blades that will be destroying and that's okay because you're about to tie the vessel off. You'll have certain blades that will, will damage the artery less so that you can then re anastomose it if you need to. And that's particularly true of bowel because it's quite often that you might open section and then want to re anastomose those. So whatever you've got clamping it off at the time, you want to use something that's not going to damage the bowel significantly. Um, same thing, Kelly, Holstead, Cryles, cold and, blood, cold and blood vessels. Tiny little one that will not damage the blood vessel, um, but it's just a smaller version. Uh, and a Kelly is uh, just a bigger version. Uh, and again, a right angle is just a I can go around the corner. Version. So quite often vessels will be understuffed. You also use this to put a stitch into the end and bring it back, hold it onto the handle, and you can pass that stitch under a vessel and someone can pick it up the other side. So you can also use it to pass a tie. It's basically to get around the corners. Uh, Hemoclip applicators, these actually, these don't clamp themselves, but they come with a little tie. You can put a little tiny piece of metal, some, kind of like a one-sided staple in there, and then pass them down with the jaws around the vessel, close it, the metal will stay there, and you can pull the instrument out. So that, um, from very big to very small, my picture seems to have disappeared, so I'm not quite sure, but you've got one, so that's right. Um, okay, grasping and holding instruments. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's lots of kinds of grasping and holding instruments, depending on what you want to grasp or hold. Um, they've both usually got a ratchet mechanism, again, exactly the same as an occluding instrument. Um, hold of tissues or hold of um, drapes and towels, which what we used to do is use something like this, a very evil instrument. 
um, called a towel clip. And what we used to do is put sterile towels around the wound and then clip in top in place. Of course, everything's sticky now, so we don't so much use these anymore. Um, but patients seem to just accept that they came out with like lots of little vampire holes all over their wound, but anyway, so towel clips. Um, I did actually once clip my boss's hand to the patient's skin with the towel clip. Um, he wasn't that impressed. I also stapled one of my boss's hands to uh, the drape uh, once as well. So we managed to get through. See how many mistakes you can make and just keep trying, it's okay. Um, they, these are often quite traumatic to tissue, so they you know they don't have the nice blades on them that um, something that's supposed to block off uh, an artery was. Um, like an alice, um, that's particularly used when they're holding up a breast lump or a mastectomy to get out of the way. They use those um, quite commonly because they really grab the tissue um, and can pull it out of the way. It sort of just hold stuff out of the way. Uh, a Babcock is a similar thing. It's usually for something small and tubular, and they talk about intestine, but usually it's only small intestine. Um, fallopian tubes, stuff like that, um, you can kind of either get all the way around it or it's relatively gentle. Uh, a cocker, so this is a cocker. Um, you can see the tips. This is really mean. This is not for something that you want to use again. Same locking mechanism, nasty mean teeth, um, and it, you know if you the thing I use that for actually is to remove a big piece of metal called the shunt tunnel when we're putting in the shunt. I only use it on the metal, um, but if you were grabbing a big piece of bowel that was going to be removed and discarded, that's a really good way of making sure that it doesn't come off in your hands. So a lot of people still use these for prepping. So you put a you know a ray tip in there in various fancy configurations um, to um, paint it on the skin. But um, this is actually it's it's a nice soft end. And so although we tend to use it a, a, a forster in the US, we call it a ramp lease. Um, they're probably slightly different. Um, you can use this for tissue as well, and because it's got a nice, it's got a nice big head. It's you know it's actually quite gentle, and you can use that um, quite well. Uh, and there's various little things that you can put a thing called a peanut, which is basically a tiny little piece of gauze used to dissect tissue to just push things out of the way. I've shown you the evil towel clip, um, which is almost. Almost along the way of the dinosaur, and a lot of people don't put this put it on the set because we have mostly paper drapes. If you put it through the drape, um, we only put a single layer on because it's impervious, uh, and so you're actually going beyond the sterile field. So you're actually putting the if it goes through the drape, it actually goes into the dermis. So we tend to use them a lot less. The other things that we use to grasp and hold are pickups or forceps. Um, Yeah, in the US they call them pickups. You'll hear that, but um, you know tissue forceps, uh, they are not tweezers. Okay, they are not. So I've heard people ask for those tweezers. Give me those tweezers over there. They're not tweezers. Um, all shapes and sizes, depending on the job that you want to do. So they're all the same basic design. Two tines held together with some version of springiness. That springiness might just come from it's made and, uh, and the metal memory. Um, some of them do actually have springs or ratchet devices. If they've got teeth, they're supposed to hold something. If they don't have teeth, they're supposed to be really gentle. Um, and they should be held uh, like this. Okay, they should be held like a pencil. A lot of people holding forceps overhand, okay, they're held like a pen, right? Uh, so learn how to do that, not like a knife, which is which is overhand. So that gives you the best control. Uh, so you've got stuff with teeth, like this one, which is a dual forcep, uh, little tiny teeth. So um, 
for fine but tough tissue, so something like the Dura. Um, something with heavier teeth like this, um, call this a penny backer. Um, it's got various names, but uh, that we use skin because it's got two teeth on one side and three teeth on the other side, so it really holds things firmly. Uh, or then something like this, so the old bayonet again. All right, so deep holes, top and use for dressings. You can pull up the dressings. It doesn't grab on the little bits of or packing because it doesn't grab on the little bits of you can hold it and place it. But you can also use this to hold delicate tissue in some way. Uh, and so that's, I don't know what that's called. I think I just called it bayonet and they give it to me, which is ridiculous really because there's a lot of other bayonets. It's got this funny end there that's if you want to grab. We particularly use that to hold fragile tumours because it's sort of got a nice, broad, gentle end. Uh, the Addison's pickup that, um, um, that is um, passing around, so it can be used for skin, can be used for Dura. Um, the, the dressing forceps that I'm passing around um, to grasp sort of more delicate tissue or dressings. That surgeons use in particular, but I use it for some peripheral nerve surgery other than bakies, and they have a, a very nice gentle serration, so they're quite strong, but they don't actually damage the tissue. The other thing that we use to grasp are needle holders, um, and they just come in different sizes. They just come in different sizes, basically depending on the kind of needle you want to hold. If you're doing a little tiny tenno, then you have a little needle holder that looks much the same as that scissors, but with a flat blade, that micro scissors. If you've got, if you're putting in great big tension stitches in an abdominal wound, that's that's that's, um, then you'll have something much bigger than this. Um, but you know, they're just a, a ratchet mechanism uh, and blades that are dependent on what sort of needle you intend on holding. But, you know, there are the sizes, long, short, fine, micro, uh, with a locking or no locking mechanism. So they're, most, they're the grasping and holding instruments. Questions about those. And then we have a bit of a grab bag of instruments that I just thought, yep, sorry. Um, as a left hand, I would use the desk. Uh, so when you're training, you got all, you're just going to have to learn to either use right-handed instruments in your left hand. So start practicing because no one will give you any uh, any great. Uh, but the nurses will load your needles left-handed, and then you know they'll they'll do what they can. But basically, all the instruments are right-handed. Eventually, a lot of left-handed surgeons, if they find that difficult, get their own instruments made. That's getting harder and harder to do. Was around them being able to be sterilised. Um, so you used to just be able to bring your instruments in and chuck them in the autoclave and everyone was happy for you to use them without really checking if they had a lot of pitting or if there was a lot of wear or whatever. So a pit in a surgical instrument is a, you know, if, it, if it's not, um, even though it's sterilised, could have another patient's tissue in it. And that's become you deal with prion diseases, stuff that you can't sterilise for. So the reason that scissors, that are Mayo scissors, cost so much more than an exactly the same pair of scissors at Bunning, now for the compliance and the pitting and the microscopic appearance of the, so that they can be sort of compliant to re-sterilising. So it's actually quite difficult to have your own instruments, but some people do that. And if you only work one place, they'll be happy to work with you. But there's lots of left-handed surgeons, they won't get out of them. But start practicing the ratchet with your left hand using the right-handed ratchet. Just practice, you'll be fine. Okay, so there's lots of fun stuff that don't really fit in those four situations. So um, cutting instrument, a bone puree. Um, this is basically a little cup that has sharp edges. So if you want to claw out a bit of bone, you can use that to do that. Um, and we use that quite commonly, particularly in the operation that I hate the most, an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. It's just an awful operation. 
One of the things that you need to do often is scrape tissue away from bone. So for us, um, make a scalp incision and then you've got to get it flat. Now you can do that with diathermy if you want to, but that devitalizes the tissue somewhat. So another thing you can use is a periosteal elevator and the orthopedic surgeons use this all the time as well. Not nearly as delicately as the surgeons do. <laughs> There's kind of loads of grunting and stuff. Um, but so a periosteal elevator, a bit of a sharp edge with the ability to push tissue forward and away. And there's, again, same thing, lots of different versions. Oh, my picture's gone from that too. Lots of different versions of sort of that pushing stuff out of the way um, elevator. So a McDonald's. Um, which is a bit of a multi, it's a fantastic, it's a multi-purpose instrument. So what, what could you do with that? Yeah. Yeah, you could do a bit of retraction. So it, it's quite a nice instrument to put in and just flick it out of the way. It's got the flat end which you can use for dissecting, particularly, you know, pushing tissue out of the way. Uh, it's really nice to put a little bit of bone wax on the end of and use it like a spatula to apply bone wax to the edge of bone. Do you know what bone wax is? Your paraffin and, um, and it's a particularly good consistency that you can, because you can't, because the blood just comes out of, you know, the marrow channels, the trabecular bone, uh, you can't, there's, there's no way to stop that bleeding. You can't get a faucet around it and cauterize it or whatever. So you can fill those holes with wax. Um, and you need to do that with a nice, beautiful, clean instrument because it stays there forever. And so if you poke it with your finger, like the orthopedic surgeons do, and you accidentally have a hole in your glove as well, you leave your germs behind in this nice inner surface that's just waiting to make a soup of abscess around it. So just remember, bone wax is forever. So McDonald is really good for that. They do lots of things with that. Box and chain, again, a really good multi-purpose instrument because it's just got kind of two pokey bits. It's got a round bit that you can poke a bit of bone wax in with. Um, you can push something out of the way. And it's got a more rounded sort of spatula-like hockey stick kind of pokey bit. Uh, and you can use that for lots of things. So that would come under the general heading of a dissector that if you wanted to just get stuff out of the way in a delicate way, you could do that. Um, there are some cutting instruments that cut stuff more than tissue. So we do have to cut often bone. When I was training, this was all we had to cut bone and we would do all of our laminectomies and everything by hand and every single neurosurgical registrar, am I going forever? No, no, no. Every single neurosurgical registrar just had blisters uh, because you would cut and cut and cut and look, I've got little tiny hands, I've got size six glove hands and these are basically made for size eight hands and so I've got no real mechanical advantage as to the size of the instrument uh, and so it was a lot of work. But basically some sharpened cut around the two edges that come together and pull a piece of bone into the middle um, to cut that out. And that's pretty painful to use, but that's a um, Northfield bone nibbler. There's little tiny ones, there's big, even bigger, enormous ones. There's a really nice one that looks a bit like a pterodactyl um, that has a double, um, double hinge mechanism that improves your mechanical advantage by doubling the hinge for weak things like that. Another way to cut bone is with something like this, which is a bone punch. So the blade is in the foot piece. Uh, if you've got a thin piece of bone, you can put it under the bone and close, and that will cut, chop through the footprint of the of the punch, a kerosene punch. We use these a lot because we've got a lot of little bits of bone, spinal sinus, stuff like that. So it's not for very thick bone. Uh, and then, you know, look, the most fun of all, really, um, hardly ever used, but the best instrument ever made. But, you know, everything, uh, so the reason we don't have blisters anymore is because everything is a power drill now. Everything is a compressed air power drill. It's really great. Um, but this was how we used to open heads 
um, or make holes in bones for various things. So that orthopods and neurosurgeons would use this. Um, so a fantastic bracing bit, just like the one at Bunnings. You would start out with something that looked like this, uh, which I'll, I'll show it to you, but it's basically got a sharp blade on this side and a sharp blade on this side. So when you turn it, you're shaving the bone. And set it down as to where you want it to go. And then start, put your hand on the top as you were brave enough to do. Uh, and go like this until you felt the tip start wobbling a bit. And that usually meant that you were through the inner table and the, the, the drill started to give, when you were in the cancellous bone, it kind of went just like through. And then you got to the side and you would, you would feel it start to rock. Uh, but it was, it was a little bit of a, you know, a bit of a judgment call. Uh, and I think the first real hole I ever did probably took at least an hour and a half uh, <laughs> because I'd turn it once and then check. I'd turn it once and then check. Um, and once you had breached the inner cortex and you could see a little bit of dura, then you would change to something like this, which is the actual burr. That's why they're called burr holes. If you drill a hole in someone's skull, they're called burr holes because you would make them with this burr. Has a non cutting tip, and you know, surgical instruments are really clever because of the way it's designed, it's unlikely to fall through the hole because it's got a flanged shape, right? So, as long as the bone's relatively strong, you can push quite hard, but it won't fall through because the top is wider than the bottom for cutting surfaces. So, you the perforator that I have this one. That's the perforator. You breach the skull with that, and then you would enlarge your burr hole with this to the to the width that you wanted it. Say do a bifrontal craniotomy. Um, that would be about seven of these, um, and by the end of it, you had a uh, effort tremor. It was pretty awful. Um, now we just go with the air, air drill. It's fantastic, but. Um, this is still used in country hospitals when they have to do a general surgeon has to do an emergency craniotomy. It's still used in many developing nations. Um, then to finish the craniotomy, you would put a piece of wire called a jiggly saw. Who's seen a vascular surgeon? Okay, so I think they still use them, or do they use power tools now? Uh, Okay, so a jiggly saw was kind of like a garrote wire, braided piece of sharp wire, and you would thread it between the two burr holes that you just made. Thread it between the two burr holes that you just made, put two handles on it, and go like this until you joined in the middle. And you do that between all the holes. And that's how they used to cut off before for an amputation as well with this sort of like garrote wire. Um, I think that's the other thing you know, that we do use a lot is suction cannulas. This is a fancy schmancy tiny little neurosurgical suction cannula. It has a hole on it and depending on how you cover that hole depends on how strong the suction is. So you can control the level of suction and there's various designs of that. Most of the stuff you'll see in general plastics or orthopedics have just got this really big thing that just goes... So it doesn't matter if they suck on a bit of stuff, but we're not supposed to suck on it. <laughs> um, probably all the instruments I have, but I'm really happy to take any questions on being in theatre, this instrument about um, any questions on general stuff about surgery. And don't steal my instruments. <laughs> I think someone's stolen something out of the trickers. Uh, okay, so we'll move to the QA now. If there's any empty floors, I'd like to come down the front if you'd like to take a seat. Oh. Oh. Um, we're just going to have a QA for the MD2s, especially who are about to start their surge rotation. Just to give you an idea like, of what, uh, how to get the best out of your rotation. So if there's empty floors, like, just come have a seat and we'll, we'll do a bit of a QA. Come on down to you, Emma. 
Can we scrap the clocks? Thanks. Has anyone not had a go at the instruments? So, you can pass the box around. Does anyone have any burning questions about their surge rotation? No? Oh, yeah. well, why don't you start um, uh, when they go to go soon? Tell us about your surge rotation when you were in MD2, and what, what your favorite kind of parts were, and then what you found to be cool. Sure. Okay. Um, so I was lucky to be on the computer for my four weeks. Um, so that was cool. I found the whole whole program really cool. Um, we were wearing white coats, so then you guess who wear the white coats? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, just I think the coolest thing I saw was one surgery where pushing around the cranial nerves, and like you could literally see the cranial nerves on the big screen, and just like so mind blowing to me. To actually see it in the flesh like that. Challenging, I found like research, not like general surgery where you can sort of get in hands on. Um, so I found it a little bit more difficult to to um, sort of get some practical hands on stuff. But my suggestion to in general about medical school, particularly for surgery and patient, is um, the more you put in and the more you're there, the more you you engage, you go to theatre, the more likely you are to do that sort of scrubbing and, and thing. So, um, and then my next two rotations, I did the general surgery, sort of pentastectomy, but it was coming towards the end of the year, so I was studying a lot. Yeah, too much, so I kind of regret that, but um, let's try and, I would, my biggest suggestion with the surgery rotation is as with every other rotation, just be there as much as possible, go to theatre as much as possible, try and like engage with the registrars, and that's how you're going to get the best possible experience. Where's the best place to engage with the registrars? Oh, I'd say on the ward rounds. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the best you get the most if you. I mean, either quickly had a look at them, even in pre op or in the. In the day of surgery, um, but if the if the registrars know you and they're already talking to you, or the consultants because they've met you on the board round, they've seen that you're keen, um, and you know whatever, then certainly I'm much more likely to say even if we can't let you scrub in, there's plenty of cases that we can't let you scrub in for, but I'm much more likely to know that you're there, know your name, and step aside and say come over here, look over my shoulder, have a look down here, can you see this, can you see that, and point stuff out and at least talk to you during the boring bits. If I haven't met you on my 7 a.m. ward round, because you've had the sleep in, and I'm sure you've tried to serve as well as you have, um, <laughs> and, you, you know, I, I haven't seen you in my clinic or anything else, and you sort of just appear in the back of theatre, it's really hard for me to sort of engage and know who you are and whatever. So I think if you're assigned to a unit, really, we all really like it if you make yourselves part of the unit and you're on the board rounds. You know, we know you've got to go to lectures, but the registrars love it if you want to go to ED and see a patient with them or stuff like that. So, yeah, sorry, I don't mean to fucking cut in, but, but no. we, we are very impressed by if you actually look like you want to be part, part of the unit. And I, I mean, look, I, I know there's some exceptions, I know there's some bastards out there, but in general, people are really pretty keen. If you look keen, uh, and we know who you are, we really want to have you there. Emily, you're keen on surgery as well. Um, tell us about like, your favourite experience in, in surgery and some advice you might give to to about stuff their rotation. Um, so my very first rotation in MD2 is in, in uh, ED and ambulatory, but I was managed to get to uh, uh, bypass surgery and a subdural hematoma during my first rotation because I rock up to the cardiothoracic uh, department and figure, oh, is there a bypass surgery that I can go to? My very first scrubbing and 
get to see my first backpack and for the who was the surgeon? Robert. And how did you make contact with Robert? Just talk to the nurse coordinator uh -huh. and then and how did you get to scrubbing? Well, the registrar answered okay. so the yeah. registrar was the link, yes. So then you made so you made you you made a personal connection and said who you are and what it means. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying. You just need to make the initiative and to be there find the opportunity. And for the subduing in the trauma, um because uh, I was assigned to the doctor and someone came in with uh, acute subduing in the trauma and because I was there during the entire research process and I was with the patient and we would have the actual CT and during the entire time I was there and I saw the research doing assessment. So uh, I just asked at the end, I just asked, is it okay for, uh, if I go with you to see uh, this emergency perinatal unit? Uh, come and I got to scrub in as well. And the consultant asked whether you'd like to scrub in. Um, Mr. Boy? Mr. Lau? Yes. Yes. yes, he's a good nurse. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very good nurse. Yeah. So, uh, and another advice I'd like to give is that before you go to an operation, anatomy, and maybe go to YouTube and just see what the basic steps involved in that surgery so that you can have pretty lots during the operation. It um, doesn't look very good when to uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, and then uh, during the operation, the consultant has to, oh, so um, intraperitoneal or and then I wasn't able to answer that. So it doesn't look very doesn't look very good, but so it's a good idea to just have a basic idea about what the surgery involves. You'll, you'll get more out of it if you study all two things beforehand. That's my advice. Thanks, Evan. Um, Ken has actually been in another uh, critical school for his MD2 research degree. So, can you tell the RNH kids about 